Wow, there's a lot of you. Hello, everybody. Happy Ramadan, Easter, Passover, and Buddha's birthday weekend. But, um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. I want to talk in relationship to uh, what Ariel mentioned, our new book uh, that came out on the 4th a few days ago, Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility. And I want to start with that subtitle because the climate requires all kinds of incredibly practical things from, from us, as Danny Kennedy said, to electrify everything, as a lot of us say, to exit the age of fossil fuel. And some of our tools are practical, some of them are scientific, but it's also about the stories we tell. Stories can be our prisons, they can be our wings, they can slam doors, they can open doors. And so I want to talk about the stories we tell, the stories that make us feel powerful and see possibility, the stories that make us feel defeated and despondent. So, you know, we tell stories where we're fragile and brittle, uh, where we ne have needs that are just so overwhelming. We tell other stories in which we're incredibly powerful and we're here to meet the needs of others, to meet the needs of the earth itself, and that we can. So the world is made out of stories, said the poet Muriel Rukeyser uh, some years ago, um, not out of atoms. And of course, it's both. And I think the scientists and engineers are doing an amazing job with atoms, but they need us storytellers to take care of the stories. And so I want to start with an amazing thing that just happened in the last week or so, um, for which one of our book's brilliant contributors, the poet and human rights lawyer Julian Aguan, um, an indigenous to the island of Guam, was a lead lawyer. The small island nation of Vanuatu in the, in the Pacific won a major victory, as the Washington Post put it, to advance international climate law after it persuaded the United Nations General Assembly to ask the world's highest international court to rule on the obligations of countries to address climate change. This is gonna make countries accountable in a way the Paris Climate Treaty, which was essentially voluntary, didn't. It's gonna really put them on the carpet if it goes through. And what and the Prime Minister of Vanuatu said, an international court of justice advisory opinion could be an important catalyst for the urgent, ambitious, and equitable climate action needed to stop global heating and to limit and remediate climate-induced human rights harms. And Vanuatu is one of the most climate-vulnerable places. And it's a, it's a place, how many of you had heard of Vanuatu before this? Oh my God, you people are really informed. A lot of people haven't. So, but, you know, to come from a place that's very small, that may go underwater, that a lot of people haven't heard of, it's really easy to be, feel powerless. But a handful of law students at the law school on the island um, decided to do something about climate. They asked themselves, what can we do three years ago? And I, you so often hear people say, even in big, big powerful places like California, there's nothing we can do, we have no power, we don't know what to do, or we could try it, but what if it doesn't work? But they just said, what can we do? We're law students, let's start legal action. And so a handful of law students on a small island ended up um, less than two weeks ago in front of the United Nations where they got unanimous approval for their resolution. It was a, a fucking amazing. <laughs> it, uh, so, and they knew what we all need to know to do what we need to do. The future is not yet written. We're writing it in the present with our actions or inactions. We, you know, the future is being decided now. We are making the future. And of course there are parameters. It's too late to pretend climate change didn't happen, but we still have time, although it's shrinking fast, to choose the best case scenario possible in this moment uh, rather than the worst. And those students, for me, were so moving and inspiring, just their decision to act with heart, act with integrity, to jump into uncertainty of whether they could win, whether they would go somewhere, and to do it. So I want to talk about four natures, the nature of hope, the nature of change, the nature of power, and the nature of abundance. 
Hope for me is about coming face to face with radical uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. So many people, I think it's particularly endemic among white America, love to stuff that full of certainty, whether it's the optimism that says everything will be fine, therefore we don't need to do anything, or the pessimism of it's all doomed and therefore we can stay home and eat Doritos and watch really bad Breaking Bad reruns or whatever <laughs> shitty thing they want to do. But the future is not yet written. We are writing it in the present. We are, particularly in this decade, more than any other in human history, in a decade of decision for what the future will look like for thousands of years. So, and we have to act without knowing what the outcome will be, which you see for everybody who struggled for human rights, for the environment, for liberation, for justice. They didn't know if they would win. You can't start out knowing that. A lot of this stuff is gonna look impossible at the outset, and then you stick around, you change people's imaginations, you win the public imagination battle, which leads to legislation, which leads to real stuff on the ground. You have to act on principle. You have to live, as my friend Roshi Joan Halifax says, you have to live by vow. So hope is neither optimism nor pessimism. It's a belief that what we do matters, even though we don't know what it will do in the end. So you may not know what you do does, but it's, you still have to do it. I take inspiration from a lot of the great voices around us. The prison activist, Mariam Kaba, reminds us, hope is a discipline. Hope, and hope is not something you have or that somebody gives you. It's your commitment. It's your integrity and your relationship to the to making something possible, whether it seems possible or not, to standing with the press, not knowing whether you can do anything or what you can do. So one, another wonderful passage by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez about when she was young, before she, in one of the miraculous things of our time, ran for office, overcame the third most powerful guy in Congress in the Democratic Party, and became one of our youngest Congress people ever. I know, I love her too. And I think, I think part of what keeps me hopeful is I'm still fucking excited about AOC winning in 2018. I'm excited about Vanuatu. I'm excited about the Paris Climate Treaty. Uh, you know, like you have, to, you have to hold on to the past in order to make the future. So AOC says, I was really wallowing in despair for a while. What do I do? Is this my life? Just showing up working, knowing that things are so difficult. And I think what was profoundly liberating was engaging my first action when I went to Standing Rock in the Dakotas to fight against a fracking pipeline. And then she says, hope is not something that you have. Hope is something that you create with your actions. Hope is something you have to manifest in the world. And once one person has hope, it can be contagious. So I think that's, you know, and imagine people saying like, well, we don't know if we'll win, so we won't do that. Somebody actually said to me, why should I have hope when I don't know if we can win? And it's like, have any of you ever played sports? Have any of, have you ever, any of you ever gone on a date? Have any of you ever had children? And we are high rolling gamblers. We take chances all the times. Our lives are made out of wild chances. Your life is made out of the wild chance, good or bad, that your parents took. Uh, to, uh, you, you know, good or bad meaning the relationship, not you. But I won't, I won't talk about my family. So, so I often see people confident that we're going to win and need to do nothing or lose that we're going to do nothing. But we live in radical uncertainty, and that's full of possibility. So, and now I want to talk a little bit about the nature of change, which is not instant results guaranteed or your money back. People are so, con so really want to have a protest on Tuesday and the government to fall on its knees on Wednesday. It does occasionally happen, mostly it doesn't. A lot of times it takes a while. Sometimes the consequences are indirect. The Dakota Access Pipeline made AOC decide to run for office, where she introduced the Green New Deal into Congress. The Green New Deal, as we all know, didn't pass, but it became, it changed how we all thought about what was possible. It became Biden's platform in his campaign. It became the Build Back Better initiative, which was so big and radical, which passed in a diminished and compromised way as the, um, the, I always want to call it the investment, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. You know, you see these chains of consequences that are unforeseeable for, beforehand and that are not always direct. 
the best changes, the ones that made our world so much more livable, tend to originate in the shadows and the margins. People think, oh, the world will be changed by the people who are in the limelight, like I am now. But it's all going to start. The good stuff starts in the shadows and the margins. At uh, Occupy Wall Street, the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter, the uprising in Iran, the new wave of feminism that really started around 2012, nobody saw them coming. They often started with people nobody had heard of or something small. Just the way Greta Thunberg was one, and what can one 15-year-old do about climate? You know what most people would have said to that 15-year-old when she sat down alone with a pretty funky cardboard sign in <laughs> Stockholm. She's a, she started a global movement. She spoke to truth to power with incredible toughness and fearlessness. And, uh, these are how these things happen. So we have to understand the nature of change is not always direct or predictable. We have to understand the nature of power, too. Everything's going to tell you that power resides in rich people, famous people, superheroes like all those stupid Marvel movies. And um, <laughs> not that I have opinions. So politicians, et cetera. But the examples I gave you are about ordinary people. Um, we have immense power, usually not alone, although sometimes one person like Greta can start something. But together, we terrify governments, we topple them, we change the world. We can't see the future, but the historical record shows that we've done it in the past over and over and over again. My wonderful friend Bill McKibben, totally exhausted at the Paris Climate Treaty, sitting on a concrete floor with me at an event outside the conference, was approached, as he has been so many times, by somebody saying, what can I as an individual do about climate? And Bill has this fantastic answer. Some of you probably already know. He just says, stop being an individual. <laughs> Join something. Find your, find your people. Find your place in the movement. Figure out what your skills are, because everyone has something to contribute. As Mary Heglar says in our Not Too Late book, everyone has there's, there's something everyone can do. And then also capitalism likes us to imagine ourselves as consumers, which is why when I ask people what they're doing about climate, you hear about climate footprints. And it's virtuous to be, you know, to eat low on the food chain and bicycle and so forth. But that's not going to change the world in the rapid. And it can be catalytic. It's good. But you're not just a consumer. You're a citizen. And I don't mean that's what your national status or your passport or whatever is. I mean that you are a citizen of the earth, and you are a member of civil society, whatever your immigration status. And that's where your power lies. We have our private lives in which we buy things and eat things and what, you know, go on vacation or don't. But we have our public lives in which we participate collectively. That's what Bill meant. And so we need to recognize, first, that we have an immense power together, and secondly, to figure out how each of us is going to orchestrate it and make it happen. Because the historical record shows us ordinary people have changed the world again and again. It always starts small. You look at the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionist movement in the 1840s in this country, and are like, are these people going to like destroy one of the most profitable economic institutions the country has ever known? Are they going to completely change the laws? Are they going to override the, the southern states, et cetera? And like, it doesn't look like that when it's like women selling pincushions at bazaars in Concord, uh, Massachusetts to raise money for Frederick Douglass's speaking tours. But you know what? They did. That's, you know, everything starts small. And, um, you know, and that's what the, if you go into the deep histories, that's what you see is that these things building. And of course, one of the things I love about the anti slavery movement is it begets the women's suffrage movement because the women are organizing, these white women are organizing against slavery. And then they're like, wow, we're not even allowed to participate in the World Slavery, Anti Slavery Congress in London. Women are not allowed to speak, they're not allowed to be seated. So they start a second movement, indirect consequences like AOC running for office because of Standing Rock is also a huge way things work. You know, history does not march forward like an army. It often scuttles sideways like a crab. It wears away stone like drips of water. It works in all these unpredictable ways because we live in beautiful, deep, 
uncertainty. And then finally, I want to talk about the nature of abundance. What we have been told over and over, and maybe it was true around the time of Al Gore and compact fluorescent light bulbs and the Priuses being brand new things, is that we now live in an age of abundance. And that's a really tricky we, because the majority of human beings don't live in an age of abundance right now. But you know, most of us in this room, we've been told we're mostly pretty comfortable. We're told we live in an age of affluence and the climate requires renunciation and austerity from us. But Thelma and I like to stand that on our head. We are poor in hope. We are poor in clean air and water. We are poor because more than 8 million people a year die directly from particulate matter from fossil fuel emissions. You know, if it was a war, we would see the carnage, but it's subtle the way the poisons of fossil fuel are. And it poisons our water, it poisons our air, it poisons our land, it poisons our future, and it poisons our politics. So let's talk about renunciation and austerity. Who here is ready to give up the age of fossil fuel? Who here is willing to give up fossil fuel corruption and tyranny? Who here is willing to give up the hopelessness and despair that climate change brings us? Who here is ready to give up the injustice and powerlessness that comes with this kind of a system, our energy system, which is our power system, which is our political system? Are you ready, are you ready for change? Yeah. So, you know, so part of changing the story means looking at all the ways we're poor now and how rich we could be if we do what the earth needs from us, what the climate needs from us. Uh, we have to do this change. We need to go into it wholeheartedly with a sense of our power, our sense of our possibility, and a sense of our, uh, the benefit for all beings if we do this thing. So let's do this thing. And I just want to stop uh, wind this up, and amazingly, I think I'm actually on time. I've got 56 seconds. We're all watching a clock up here. Say, I want to end with where I began with Julian Aguan, poet, indigenous Guam, uh, lawyer for human rights, lead lawyer for what just happened in the United Nations. And he writes, not only is Vanuatu leading the campaign for an international court of justice advisory opinion on climate change, but it's also calling on all states to sign up to a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to phase down coal, oil, and gas production in line with 1.5 degrees. Vanuatu may be small, but its emancipatory vision is huge, and it is committed to solidarity and collective answer. The present decade, in some ways the most turbulent in the history of the human race, is our last chance to get it right. And now we are one step closer to success by virtue of the question that Vanuatu, flanked now by the rest of the world, has asked the International Court of Justice. It's an epic question, epic in the truest sense of the word, meaning it asks the court to bring the entirety of international law to bear on the conduct that has driven our planet to the brink of catastrophe. The court's answer could turn the tide, he concludes. And I conclude, it's all about the stories. We're in the middle of the story, not the end. We're writing it every day with what we do and don't do. So seize control of the means of production here, which is the stories we tell, the stories we make, the stories we live, the stories we dream, and live out the story that brings us to the best future, the future that all the young people here deserve, all the people yet to come deserve, all the living things deserve. It is possible, and stories are one of our superpowers for all of us. Thank you so much.